Welcome EMF Warriors to a new presentation. You are not going to believe who I have on the show today for this podcast. It's Dr. Andrew Marino. Uh, as many of you are aware, he's been studying, researching, been all over the entire spectrum with electromagnetic energy, and he's worked directly with Robert O. Becker back in the days. I believe he has a half a century of research under his belt. It's just amazing. How are you doing today, Andrew? Terrific. Glad to be here. Yeah. So I've, I've gone through about three-fourths of your book now. Um, I have it back here, as you can see, Becker the Researcher that you've just put out, and it is gripping. I'm enjoying every moment of it. And I just have to say, I just think it's amazing that at this time in your life, you're, you're still, you know, talking about this issue, going into the books. Um, I know, you know, I'm sure you might have even more projects planned, but I just, I just have to thank you. I have to like give you gratitude. Actually, all of our EMF warriors are grateful for the works you've put into this issue over this last half century. Appreciate the comment very much. This is a, the sweetest time of my life. I'm free now from a lot of uh, mundane things that um, they consume my time while I, before I had retired. And now I uh, can devote myself 100% to writing, and, which is what I'm doing and, and talking and uh, singing my song. If anybody listens, great. If not, I'm just still enjoying the singing. Yeah, wonderful. So my, my first question I have for you is it's, it's almost mind-blowing to me that most of the mainstream really do not know your works and Becker's works kind of like as a just a normal daily basis occurrence because like, you know, we hear Bill Gates, we hear all the technology side of things, but we really don't hear the research, how it impacts our bodies. And really, that's, that's my first question to you is, how, how is it that your brilliant works and the works of Becker um, really aren't known by a lot of people in mainstream? Well, <laughs> I, think, I think you have to ask yourself, uh, which room in, in the mansion uh, uh, are you standing when you ask that question? <laughs> uh, if... Um, uh, uh, it, it's certainly not true that uh, uh, that my uh, uh, work is, is uh, not known, uh, and certainly not true that, that Dr. Becker's uh, work is not known. I've I've written more uh, peer-reviewed uh, publications uh, than anybody in the world. Uh, I've written five books, and I'm working on two more books. Uh, there's nobody in the world who's interested in this topic that doesn't know about my work. Now, they may not like it. They may not agree with it. Uh, uh, they, they may try to uh, oppose it. Um, they may uh, uh, disregard it, uh, but it, they, they certainly don't ignore it. That's just not true. Um, yeah. More fundamentally, that is to say, going into another room in the mansion, uh, um, your comment can be, the question can be uh, construed as referring to uh, um, the, the general consensus of, of authorities or authoritative blue ribbon committees who have spoken. Mm -hmm. Now, um, there has never been an authoritative blue ribbon committee that was not rigged in favor of the industry. That is to say, the people appointed to the committees were employees were contractors, were grantees of the industry. Well, how are they going to opine? I mean, uh, common sense tells you uh, that they're going to support the people who have paid them. I mean, little children can understand that. Uh, uh, but uh, what you hear in the, in, the, in the popular press often are the conclusions of those committees. Uh, consequently, uh, um, a, a, a naive individual who comes to this area uh, comes across those generalized conclusions. If they don't go any deeper, then they are looking at the top of the, uh, the iceberg and they're not seeing the reality underneath. Yeah. Uh, that's the source. That's the reason why there's a perception in some people's eyes who don't know the territory and that uh, my work and the work of people like me um, hasn't had much of an effect. Yeah, that makes perfect sense to me too. 
uh, I'm, I'm really referring to at times, even the people out on the street that, you know, in, in the, my generation, the generation at, or right before, you know, right after me where there's, you know, 15, 16 year olds on the street. And it's, it's, uh, almost a tragedy to see now for me and my, from my perspective, because they just blindly use, you know, devices right up on their heads and, uh, don't think anything of it. And I see them complaining about headaches and just the normal stuff but they, they have no sense they have no sense of risk when you were 16 years old uh just like me i'm sure you did a lot of foolish <laughs> and i'm sure you didn't do a lot of research into what was going to harm you i'm sure you probably figured that nothing would harm you yes <laughs> in your old stick so uh the, the the fault lies much deeper in our society it allows it, it, it lies in the fact that we have a no, no protection uh, against um, uh, against people inadvertently causing themselves harm and disease. Uh, if you are going to take a medicine, uh, the FDA has got a pre-market approval uh, a system set up, and the manufacturer has got to prove safety and efficacy. Uh, but if you have a device that you want to put electromagnetic energy into the environment, the rules of the game do not require you to have pre-market approval uh, showing safety. You can just go do it, and the only way you can uh, stop an industry is to prove that they cause cancer, which or some disease, which is very difficult. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, but that's the only protection that those sixteen-year-olds have, which is essentially none. Right. Uh, those. That's right. So. A question for you, after having this so many decades um, under your belt in this particular research field, if you were gifted like hundreds of millions of dollars to use for research funding uh, and gifted either by the taxpayers or gifted by a special organization or an independent, um, you know, anonymous organization, what would you actually be focusing on? Well, um it, it depends really on whose money I'm spending. If I'm spending the taxpayer's money, then I would do uh, animal studies because uh, the taxpayers have a right to a return on their investment, their tax money. Uh, and, and the way we evaluate risks in our society is to expose animals. It's immoral to expose human beings and make them guinea pigs, which is what we're doing now in effect. Mm -hmm. uh, I would do animal studies and then I would publish the papers showing that there was an effect or there wasn't an effect under these conditions on an animal. But the idea of arguing that if the animal was adversely affected uh, by uh, an electromagnetic field, then it's likely you as a human being are going to be uh, adversely affected because animals and human beings more or less work the same. Uh, I'd be obligated to uh, do those kinds of studies because it's their money. Uh, that's the way tax money should be spent for research uh, uh, when it's given individuals. Yeah, that's if, right. Uh, if it's my money, then uh, I can spend it uh, uh, the way I please. Uh, and I, can, I can spend it for my own uh, edification. And what I'd really like to know is whether my uh, published papers regarding mechanisms of interaction, both high frequency, uh, cell phones, and low frequencies, uh, high voltage power lines and smart meters. Mm -hmm. uh, I have published papers regarding mechanisms in both areas, the biophysics and the biology. I've done them both. But I would like to do more. I would like to have deeper understanding, more perfect knowledge. Uh, why? Because... I find it enjoyable, it's satisfying, it's the highest level of attainment in the fields that I've studied. That's what I would do. But it's my money and I can, I can use it for myself. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So yeah, like taking kind of a little off tangent with that point that you just said, like obviously you studied a lot with salamanders, with Becker and a lot of the animal studies, like after I've read your books and Becker's books, it's just kind of a no-brainer. It's almost becomes common sense to see that these mechanisms that you can see happening in other animals, why couldn't we just apply this to humans or, or at least get more funding this direction to um, have more research studies 
overall just in the research so it you know it could reach a tipping point where you know kind of enough is enough um you, in, the, in the real world uh, of, of science and funding science there are two kinds of experiments uh, one kind seeks mechanisms and one kind seeks effects <laughs> irrespective of mechanisms mm -hmm. now what people care about although they may not know it is effects they don't care about mechanisms. If I show you that an EMF causes cancer, then that's all the information you need and you're going to avoid that EMF, irrespective of the molecular mechanism. Right. So they're two separate, entirely different things. They should never be confounded. It just, it's a, grace, a gross disservice for, for uh, people uh, to themselves when they can confound those two notions. Effects, and mechanisms. Both can be studied by the scientific method. Uh, I would use the money from taxpayers to study effects uh, in order to answer questions about whether there are risks, which is really what people care about. I would not use it for mechanisms. I'd use my money for mechanisms. Two entirely separate things. Yes, yes. Wonderful. So I don't want to give any spoilers on the book you just wrote, but um, there, well, most people realize that Becker was pretty much exiled past 1980, and it appears the science also kind of has gone a little bit exiled from certain perspectives, from certain opinions, and from people we hear. But um, how is it that we have continued to have EMF exposures around the office and the workplace environments to this day, even though we've known so much about this issue over the last, you know, 30, 40 years? Um. Number one, I have no problems about a spoiler for the book because I think most people are not going to buy the book and, and the message of the book is worth understanding. So I hope, I hope people will at least go on the Amazon website and read about, about what it's about. Mm -hmm. um, uh, if they do that, I'm happy. If they bought a copy, that would be terrific, but that's not essential. No problem about s s spoilers. Uh, and he wasn't, uh, he wasn't driven... Um, into exile so much as he drove himself into exile. Mm, he was sitting on top of the world. He was a, he was a founding father of this field. Uh, but he had certain, he had certain um, uh, flaws in his character. Uh, 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 he, was, he, was, he was like someone out of a Sophoclean play, uh, uh, like a, like a Philosides, uh, made great achievements, uh, got into a tremendous position, had the most powerfully funded and productive laboratory in the world in this area, mm -hmm. uh, but, but would, not, would not change his strategy in order to deal with the smaller minds that were out there that were opposing him. There are ways to do it, but he was stubborn to the point of, um, of uh, defeating himself. So he went into exile, and when his voice was removed, um, uh, the, 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 the forces that remained were the economic forces of industry. In this country, the only research that gets done is the research that's paid for by the National Institutes of Health, which is purely reductionistic and absolutely an antithetical to his approach antithetical to good science as far as I'm concerned. There's military funding and they're interested only in better weapons and not in protecting health. Um, we saw that very clearly after we saw what happened to the sanguine funding. And then we have economic uh, interests like high voltage power lines and mobile phone companies and they're interested in raising money. Uh, there's no chance that they would fund a research unless they were required to do it. And in this country, there's no force requiring them to do it because of the way, uh, uh, the way regulation uh, uh, evolved in this country in the late 1960s. So where we are now is an absolute inevitable consequence of the funding patterns, which are to not fund the kind of research that people actually want. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's a great point. So do you think the mechanistic reductionist point of view really has driven us um, deeper down this path or do you think there are other issues that of it that we might not be aware of that you could give us insight on 
where we are now is a result of the, uh, uh, um, several factors coming together. Uh, the, the, the oldest being the way experimental biology became organized uh, 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 in the period of its development. Uh, experimental biology is the science that underpins medicine. Uh, experimental biology did not exist until the early part of the 20th century. That's when it was created. And the fathers of experimental biology uh, uh, all took as their model uh, physics. Physics was remarkably successful. But physics is a simple science. Uh, four sets of equations govern the entire world that we know about. Just four sets. I could. I could list them for you they, on two or three pages of paper. They control everything. In the world of physics, the non-living world, the living world is much more complex. <laughs> yes. Much more complex. The fathers of experimental biology adopted the reductionistic model that the physicists had developed and showed worked perfectly for the inanimate world. When they did, they threw away any possibility of understanding how life works. Mm -hmm. So they built a biology that is purely reductionistic. To the experimental biologists today, the professional experimental biologists, science is a reductionistic enterprise. They care about genes. They care about molecules. They care about biochemicals. All knowledge that's important all that's useful, but all that has no possibility of understanding life because it doesn't exist at that level. It exists at a more organized level farther up. Well, if you take the point of view that you're not doing science unless you're doing reductionistic science, then you cut away all EMF issues of the kind that I am concerned with because it's kind that you and the people at EMF wires are concerned with. You don't fund them, you don't interpret them, you don't deal with them, you simply ignore them. Uh, that, that was um, a, 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 the first major step. Then in, um, in the 1960s, when the government started, the government began to realize the EMFs were being dumped into the environment at an unprecedented rate. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, Congressman Rogers uh, from Florida uh, authored a bill, a Radiological Protection Act of 1967. And he wrote Dr. Becker and asked Dr. Becker for support uh, because he wanted, to, he wanted to have pre market approval controls. And he wrote those into the bill. Becker supported the bill, but the powers that be, the strong economic powers, uh, um, uh, blocked it in 1967 and 1968 when it became law. The idea of having pre market approval controls, as for example for drugs, was written out. And once that happened, it's the Wild West. Anything you can do, because no individual is going to be powerful enough to confront a huge industry in court and show that they injure people. Uh, uh, that was. Um, uh, that was a watershed event in this country. 1968, it happened. Uh, after that, we began developing smartphones. We began building more and more high voltage power lines. And the government now was called upon to regulate them. The government has got to rely on organized science and on what it says. The government does not go out and do its own research. Uh, what's the government going to do? Set its face against um, against these industries when it has no hard scientific evidence uh, and it has no way of generating hard scientific evidence because the way of generating knowledge is to do reductionistic studies and you can't get answers to the questions that concern you and me that way. So the government's hands are tied. It only responds to public outcries. Mm -hmm. And there was only one public outcry. I don't know if you remember the movie, um, Eddie, Eddie Murphy, uh, um, 19, uh, 
1992, distinguished gentleman. He goes to Congress, and while he's in Congress, his women come and they say, Congressman, our, our children are getting cancer because they live beside power lines. Mm. We need a study uh, to answer the question. Right. So Congress creates a, a, a fund of money to answer the question. And it, uh, it, it, it sets up a structure to fund studies to find out if high voltage power lines cause cancer. Uh, who does it give the money to? It gives the money to people who come from industry. Mm -hmm. The only individual in that program that was funded that I know about that wasn't from industry was me. I took the money. I had a, I had a promise to do the reductionistic studies they wanted, but I didn't. I did integrated, integration type studies. Uh, I published seven papers showing that EMFs affect the immune system. Then, the, then in 1998, uh, uh, the National Institute of Health and Environmental, not National Institute of Environmental Sciences, which organized this uh, and, and funded the money, funded the research, had a series of panels to evaluate the research. And on the panels were the people who worked for industry. They concluded that there was no problem. <sighs> yeah. That's it. That ended it completely. Yeah. Then smartphones, then Wi-Fi, then smart meters, and here we are today. That was the last government entree. There hasn't been a federal government-funded program since 1998. When my grant ended, everybody else's grant had ended, end of story. Wow. So do you see any hope for future funding uh, You know, it, with research projects that is more credible science that doesn't have this interweaving of industry into it? And also with experimental controls, like there's so many studies where there's not con proper control set up. So the studies, once they're done, industry can come back and say, hey, well, you didn't have these controls in place. Well, it's because, thank you, I need more money. Um, are, you seeing, are you seeing that kind of stuff? Like, two, what does the future look like? Two, two separate questions. <laughs> there's, there's zero possibility of funding for independent investigators. Zero. Uh, unless there's a political movement afoot that calls attention to this problem and brings into play one of these multi-billionaires who has money that wants to do something to help humanity. That's the only possibility I see. It's certainly not going to come from the mobile phone companies. It's certainly not going to come from the Electric Power Research Institute. And it's certainly not going to come from the National Institutes of Health. That's the, so that's the only other source of big money. It's not going to come from the military. There is no other source of money. Uh, uh, so it's got to come from, uh, from one of these billionaires. Uh -huh. It's the only possibility. And the issue is not... And the issue is not a defendant against an assertion of, um, of uh, improper controls. The independent scientists who would do the studies are sophisticated people and have proper controls. Okay. There is no valid argument uh, against improper controls in peer-reviewed published studies. It doesn't exist. Uh, I, I have, I have uh, uh, put forth and described... Uh, published studies in court when I was criticized and cross-examined by the biggest barracudas in the world who work for the, for the industry. And uh, not once was, um, was, the, uh, was the point you made successfully made. That doesn't occur. That's a figment of the popular imagination. Mm. Uh, the controls are proper. Mm. It's the interpretation of the evidence. We all agree on whether the published studies were done properly or not, and most published studies were done properly. It's were they designed properly. Mm -hmm. Take Rubin's studies, for example. Rubin is the guy who proposes uh, uh, that there is no such thing as a, uh, electromagnetic hypersensitivity based on his studies. Mm -hmm. His studies are rigged by design. The design of the study is such that no result can show that the phenomenon exists. 
So therefore, he does the study with the proper controls in his design. <laughs> I see, I see. That's the obvious conclusion. Yeah, it's like one chain. It's like one chain back. It's like just design the experiment differently, have everything looking like it's perfect in place because it is with the controls, but because the design is, is almost designed to fail, you get what you want. Exactly. Right. Those are the two points I wanted to make. It's the design, not the controls, and there's right. no possibility of money unless Gates comes in. <laughs> right. So many EMF warriors at our Facebook site, they, we, we like to entertain creative concepts around this issue and try to interlink other disciplines like in and out and through this because we want to try to make the connections on uh, what, what impacts electromagnetic energy um, can have like just through the whole like side of everything. So of course, um, it's almost... I find at times it's kind of risky to do this, especially a person that doesn't have a broad scientific background because we come up with really cool ideas, but it becomes almost science fiction and it can be like just totally the wrong conclusions. Um, but how do we like on this issue get to the point where we can use our creativity um, to explore around the edges of electromagnetic electricity uh, uh, energy? Uh, great, great question. Uh, I, I want to answer it uh, at, the, uh, at two levels. Um, uh, the, the first is that um, is that this idea of using creativity um, it's got to be um, severely limited uh, and controlled and focused. Uh, 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 it reminds me of it reminds me of the story of uh, Ulysses when he returns from Troy. He lands uh, he lands in Ithaca, but he lands at night, and there's no moon, uh, and he doesn't know where he is. He's in his own kingdom. He's the king of Ithaca, and he doesn't know he's there, but because it's all black, it's all dark. Um, when you ask uh, the smartest people in the world uh, who are not knowledgeable about the scientific mumbo jumbo that exists in this field to try to explore and make sense you 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 you're asking you're putting them in a position of Ulysses landing in the, in the in the black of night how can they make sense of it how can they see they don't have the proper tools um uh, it's kind of a mistake better they should back up a little bit and ask some common sense questions uh, and, and, and not at the level of mechanisms. They should have nothing to do with mechanisms. They should be focused on whether there's bona fide evidence of health risks. That is to say, on effects in animals. That's what creates the logical nexus with the idea of a health risk. That's where, it ought to, that's where their attention ought to be focused. And, and when they hear people guessing whether they have MDs and PhDs or not, who have no stature in the field, no, no uh, bona fides in the field, no publications, no, 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 no uh, gravitas, uh, <laughs> coming forth with theories. They want to use their common sense and recognize that they are, that they are being sold a pig in the poke here. Those are not people that they would uh, follow any more than they would they would buy something based on an advertisement that they saw on television mm. uh, they, they can't put aside their common sense they've got to be careful about who they put their faith in when they have any element of faith uh, they want to minimize their elements of faith and maximize their own research in the right area which is not mechanisms but effects so yeah, I, I I concur with you on that one as well. Uh, it, it's it's sometimes hard. Like people get really enthusiastic, they'll use their creativity and come up with a complete wild theory about or hypothesis or idea about something, and and I just have to back off and say, you know, go to the research, go to the materials, you know, educate yourself a little bit more, uh, like that. It's it's interesting. Many of us at EMF Warriors, um, we we see a lot of the issues around also the messaging of this uh, EMF uh, issue, right, that we have. 
And some of the messaging we see like now, like it's very common, a person will pick up a tablet and dive into the, to the fine print and see in there there's the RF warning. And of course, a lot of people don't know it exists, but um, people have been arguing like the messaging of that and how we ended up with, okay, I see RF warning. Why don't we see microwave warning? And if uh, I think a lot of people do have common sense to know that microwave radiation cook, you know, in your oven cooks your food, it possibly could cook us. And, you know, you hear a word like microwave, it's a little more powerful to the ear compared to RF. So, um, but in the, in the scientific literature, right, radio frequency, microwave, these are all like almost interchangeable um, uh, terminologies. I just wanted to get your insight on, did this RF warning like inside of these phones and tablets, um, who decided this? Was it just industry or um, was it deliberate? It might not have been deliberate at all. And instead of using the word microwave, so people know they're using microwave devices. Uh, it's hard for me to um, it's hard for me to appreciate um, the concern that you're expressing because because I know uh, that, that the words uh, all mean the same thing, and I know that whatever words we use, uh, the the underlying rea the underlying reality is that um, is that uh, uh, electromagnetic fields essentially come. Uh, in, in only two species, um, high frequency and low frequency. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and now, uh, whether we call them microwaves uh, or RF, with two words for, used for high frequency, used interchangeably, right. uh, or low frequency, or uh, also called power frequency. Um, uh, the, 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 the body has uh, separate uh, 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 mechanisms for detecting the presence of these fields, this, this energy. The, 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 the focus should not be on the terminology. I, I, every time I hear any discussion, uh, any um, uh, uh, quibbling about the terms, I, my, 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 it breaks my heart because, because uh, I can just see the mavens in industry sitting back, stroking their beards and laughing because it, okay. it means people are, are, are chasing their own tail. They're, they're getting sidetracked. It's, it's, a, it, it's, it's, it's a complete non-issue. There's high frequency and there's low frequency. And, and there's, there's, uh, there's, a, there's a, a, the species of high frequency, the one that's most common, Wi-Fi smartphones, which is pulsed high frequency, mm -hmm. which is the single most important uh, uh, a way of delivering high energy EMFs for affecting the human body, for affecting the brain in particular. All of the energy that they're exposed to, with few limitations today, is pulsed. Ideally designed to be detected by the body because the, the human body uh, responds not uh, principally to the intensity of the field, it responds to the change going from no field to field or field to no field. That's what a pulse is. Mm -hmm. A cell phone has 218 of those a second. So it has, it has uh, uh, 436 transitions, each of which can be detected by the human brain. I mean, I've written papers and described the experimental evidence for that mm -hmm. and showed the theoretical basis for it. So we want to think in terms of low frequency and high frequency, pulse and not pulse, high frequency. That's as far as you need to go to deal with all the issues that concern people that would come to your website. Now, scientific purposes alone, edification, uh, perfect knowledge, uh, that's another matter. That's not what most people care about. Right. And if they think they care about it, they've been tricked. Nice. Thank you for that. Uh, yeah, definitely we'll be promoting and talking about, you know, high frequency, low frequency, and trying to get the terminology pretty straight on this. Um, just change subjects a little bit. Um, let's talk about EHS, which is electromagnetic hypersensitivity. 
Uh, many doctors to this day will not recognize the term as a real condition, and patients are often thrown out the doc out of doctor's offices or diagnosed even with a psychological ailment coming to a doctor telling them that they have sensitivities to, to EMFs. So we've had a lot, like so many personal experiences on EMF warriors all around this issue. And really a, a big question remains is, are we going to have trained doctors in the future that can help people with electromagnetic illnesses? Um, uh, I, have, I have an answer and I have an explanation, uh, but I think it's going to be um, uh, somewhat depressing. Mm. Um, uh, medicine has evolved into um, forms of specialization and super specialization. We had surgery, then we, we broke off orthopedic surgery and many other specialties. Then from orthopedic surgery, we broke off uh, a surgery that uh, has to do with individual joints. So we educate orthopedic surgeons that specialize in only the hand or only the shoulder or only the knee or only the hip. Uh, uh, and the funding patterns uh, have followed this age of specialization. The, the funding patterns in, the, in the, all of surgery are like that. So, um, in, in the medicine area, we have specialized and specialized and specialized so that we have now uh, the, the least, uh, the, the, the poorest paid physicians or the primary care physicians, they work the hardest and they're the paid the least. And they're the people who take care of individuals who would exhibit electromagnetic hypersensitivity. Mm -hmm. uh, they are at the bottom of the economic totem pole. And now we ask them to treat people who have EHS, who are a very difficult group of people to deal with. Uh, they have been shunned, they have been shamed, they have been ignored, and they are plainly pissed off at the medical profession for the way they've been treated. Uh, so it's no surprise that the people who, uh, uh, who work in primary care want to shun them. Uh, uh, they don't know what to do with them. They learned nothing about them when they were in medical school. They can't make any money, and they can be the target of abuse. Common sense tells you that this is a self-perpetuating scenario that's headed to a deep, dark place. Uh, they're going to make people who come to your website more and more uh, uh, angry. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that's the, the big picture. Added to that are companies like the mobile phone companies that are creating literature aimed at demonizing these people. Uh, they all have psychosomatic industries, uh, psychosomatic injuries. Mm -hmm. they, are they are creating literature, which if a PCP, a primary care physician, did go to the literature to look it up, they are likely to find right off the bat the work that's been planted there by the, uh, by the industry. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a difficult situation. Mm -hmm. so Despite we that, there are efforts underway particularly in Europe, zero in the United States, particularly in Europe, aimed at developing a diagnostic tool that a physician can go through in order to reach a clinical judgment regarding the presence of EHS. Mm -hmm. If you want to use uh, science to arrive at a judgment, then you're going to have to do what I did. <laughs> you're going to have to conduct a scientific study. Mm -hmm. But no one wants to pay a half a million dollars to conduct a study like I did. Uh, yeah. Best you're going to get are clinical judgments based on a diagnostic tool. And there are efforts in, Russia, in uh, uh, Europe to develop such a tool. There's the only possibility of some short-term relief. Other than that, particularly in this country, the outlook is bleak. Yeah, that's that's amazing information, though, that you just shared that I had never even heard of that. Yeah, going down a path of having something else diagnosed uh, in a medical office that you might have this ailment could go a long way to, um, you know, giving more credibility to the mainstream, to the public 
uh, realizing that it's a real thing because even in uh, discussions online with people, when I even sometimes mention the subject to friends that I know outside of science, they, 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 you know, they, they balk and they laugh at the idea that we could even be damaged by this. Um, so do we ever think that we're going to find in the future a larger body like the World Health Organization or another group to classify this, um, the, the lower and higher frequencies as a class you know, 2A carcinogen or even a class 1 carcinogen, or does it even matter? Uh, I don't think it matters uh, because it's already been classified in class 2B, which is good enough. Um, but, but, but the whole, the whole premise of your question is makes an assumption that, uh, um, uh, that, that I think needs to be questioned. Mm -hmm. uh, who, who is that World Health Organization? <laughs> right. <laughs> okay, the World Health Organization is a, a central place where a, a, a committee exists that uh, holds itself out as a, an expert uh, uh, on EHS. Among other things, EHS. How does somebody get to be an expert on a, on a World Health Organization committee? They are recommended by member states, member countries. When member countries make recommendations, uh, 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 how do they decide on who to recommend? They turn to their industry and say, who should we recommend, Joe? <laughs> In Australia, they recommended Rapicelli. Uh, the, 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 um, the most rigorously dishonest uh, and corrupt uh, individual in the field of EMFs that I have ever met personally. Uh, he now runs the World Health Organization effort in evaluating EMFs. Who's appointed to his committee by these other states? People as bad as him. Hmm. So. What sense does it make to ask what this committee is going to say? Mm -hmm. We know what it's going to say. What it's going to say is that everything is fine. Don't worry about it. So the idea that you can count on the World, War, the World Health Organization to make a recommendation that you can rely on is fatuous. You, you shouldn't do that. Uh, about half of the Blue Ribbon Committees that have opined uh, uh, have said everything is perfectly safe. Uh, every one of them is rigged by the industry. Every one of them. About half of the Blue Ribbon Committees that have opined that there's a problem has no representation from the industry. They have opined that there is a problem. And thus it goes. Just science in general, like, like I think back into my uh, historical science days in college and like people were doing science for the reason of the scientific method to, to really understand the natural laws of the universe and to know how these in, could impact our health and other, right, other elements. And it's as if in my modern day, like because, you know, back in the 80s and 90s that, that I grew through, I saw that element still existing where people wanted to do science for the science and it was the science that mattered, not anything else that could, you know, pull in and, and interweave their web into their, their, you know, the, I guess you would say the morale of it, you know, the virtues of doing science for that reason. So it really gets me thinking about like what we would, what would you tell a young person today if they're interested in doing science for the pure aspect of it and what to study um, in school to, you know, for the subjects of EMF, if EMF was a focus they were really interested in. Um, Scott, you've just delivered uh, a, 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 a homage to the naive uh, uh, idealism of, of, uh, of, a, of a young person uh, trying to understand the world. Uh, the world of science um, was almost never like that. Certainly not at the time when you were a very young man. You thought it was. I thought it was, yes. But it wasn't. Uh, science is like anything else uh, in, in this world. Uh, what gets paid for is what gets done. The military wants a better gun or a better bomb, it pays for it. 
Uh, industry wants rigged research to, to uh, uh, rationalize its product, it pays for it. The National Institutes of Health wants research that will not piss off anybody. It funds only reductionistic uh, uh, studies, which can never cause problems. It's impossible. It can never have any relevance to the real world in terms of health risks. It can't because it, it functions at a level below life. It functions at the molecular level. Uh, and so it pays for that because it wants to avoid controversy. Can you imagine what happens when the National Institute of Health funds a study like it made two mistakes, it funded me twice. I published papers showing that there, are, that there were grounds for health risks. I lost the grants immediately and never got them again. I, uh, I, I, I had some, I had some benefactors who got me the grants against the, the tide of not funding people who do the kind of research I do. So what gets done is what gets paid for. Uh, 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 when people uh, um, are, are paid to do research that's relevant to the real world, health risks, then, then that's what they would do. If they're paid to not do it, then they won't do it. Then they will do what? They will do what pleases them, what, what satisfies them. They will do the kind of research that you described. That, that will have some, I mean, these are not, these are not mean people. They want to benefit humanity. Right. And they think that the kind of detailed knowledge they're generating in some way, in some future world, will benefit humanity. Uh, so that's what they'll do. Uh, and that's the kind of research that NIH function uh, funds, and that's the only source of funds for experimental biology in the United States today of any consequence. I see. So the world you described may have existed before I was born, <laughs> but ceased uh, existing when I entered into my, into my uh, maturity. And by the time you were entering into yours, I can guarantee it was gone because I was there and I observed it. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. It's definitely an idealistic perspective of science that I still hold to this day. But I think there, like, I think there could be people out there that want that to happen and realize the reality of the situation that it just is almost impossible or practically impossible to even accomplish today. So really, it comes down to now knowing what we know about this issue. Um, it's like you cannot depend. I, I I see it this way: you cannot depend on anyone else but ourselves to like, you know, kind of help start fixing our world and saying, well, we, we have the evidence in front of us. We've read these books, we've read the research. And if industry's not gonna help us, government's not gonna help us, nobody's gonna help us, we have to help ourselves. Is that a good, maybe a good analysis of it? Uh, it's not good, it's perfect. Okay. <laughs> it's, the only, it's the only way to proceed. It, it, uh, it's gotta proceed by virtue of a political activity. We had the uh, we had the uh, civil rights movement in the 50s. We had the environmental movement in the 60s. We had uh, women in the ERA. We had the Vietnam War. We had uh, uh, we had the rise of uh, uh, evangelicals and, and political domains. We had uh, uh, we had uh, same-sex marriage. Uh, uh, we had the abortion controversy. Those are all uh, uh, political movements. It got started and made hay in this country because it's the greatest country in the world. The reason it's the greatest country in the world is because the, the, the political dialogue can drive what happens if people care. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and if people don't care, then the people who, who, uh, who have vested financial interests are going to continue to win the day. So not only is that uh, uh, um, uh, a possible way, that's the only way it's going to change. Uh, it, the, the, the historical evidence, as I see it, is abundantly clear. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like, it's funny, even on a localized level, um, I, there's no, like, trying to convince some of my own family members and friends about this issue. I, I, I almost have to think of myself as, okay, I'm going to be a role model to them. I'm going to show them the kind of things I do, what I call um, EMF hygiene. Uh, I will, you know, practice, 
you know, like right now I have this wired, everything's wired that I'm hooked up to. So they'll see me as if I'm in uh, 1989, everything's wired up and ask me, why, are, why is this connected to Wi-Fi? You know, just <laughs> those kind of normal things you'd ask in 2017. But um, th I don't really say anything unless they ask me. I don't volunteer information. Uh, even though these are my friends and my family, I want to let them know. And it's, it's you know, in, internally it can definitely cause an emotional reaction when you see them doing stuff that doesn't really fit my emotional uh, hygiene. So is that kind of the right analysis to approach this with people? Just let them start seeing the behaviors of other people and, and, and then having them ask the questions or should we be doing things to kind of like, you know, subtly being the ninja and asking questions and, and, and kind of like showing them the way on this. I, I don't think so. I think you hit it. Uh, I think you hit the nail on the head. Uh, and, and it's a, uh, it's a, uh, it's a principle of human behavior and human psychology uh, that goes all the way back uh, uh, to the time of uh, uh, Plato. Uh, uh, you start asking, uh, you start asking, uh, uh, can knowledge be taught? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and, and, uh, and, uh, and it really can't. It's got to be learned. Uh, there's got to be a motivation inside people uh, to want to ask questions. Uh, if you, if you uh, hit your star, uh, your goal in life uh, to, uh, to, to a, uh, an endeavor in which you're going to try uh, to change somebody, uh, to get them to do what you want. I can't, you, man, you're cruising for a bruise. It, <laughs> yeah. it, it, it ain't going to work. Uh, uh, you you, you got to first straighten your own mind out about the way things are. And then, and then you can make available information for people who want. Uh, uh, and then uh, if they come to you uh, and, uh, and ask you questions and ask you to defend things, then you speak. And that's what I've followed my whole life. I, I do my experiments, I write my papers, and I go want to do more experiments. And every once in a while, maybe I average once or twice a year for the last 30 years, I, I, I go into court and I take an aggressive position on behalf of somebody who's agreed by EMFs. And I open myself up to the these these barracudas who work for the for the for the industry, big sharp teeth, uh, uh, all the resources in the world, and they come at me, uh, and I try to defend uh, the position that I've taken, uh, and I try to not convince the judge and the jury, uh, but I do that only discreetly, only under certain circumstances, only when when the conditions are right. Uh, but uh, then I back off to my uh, my day job, which is just generating information, putting it out there, not conditioning uh, my uh, notion of my success in life on changing somebody's opinion. It, 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 you can't do it. You got to try once in a while, sometimes, very, very, very occasionally <laughs> under appropriate circumstances, but don't make your living there. Yeah, it's like feeling out if, if the moment is right in conversation or whatever to like insert a little bit to almost get the conversation rolling, but not to like try to control or take over, right? right. <laughs> the best thing, the best thing um, uh, you, you could do in your situation, I think, is understand what's happening and to make that information available in a coherent, logical, accessible way on the website right. and then the people come to you. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so are there things you do um, at your home or at your work even uh, that, you know, help with your own EMF hygiene or do you just take more moderate approaches with it? Um, I'm really curious about, about that with your half century of knowledge on this issue. Um, I, uh, I, I act uh, reasonably. Uh, I, I don't, the, the, uh, the background EMF in my house is less than 0 0.0001 microwatts per square centimeter. Mm -hmm. You can't get much lower in our society. I keep the Wi-Fi off. I use Ethernet. Uh, I don't need Wi-Fi. Uh, I, I, I use my cell phone very rarely. And when I do, I use it in speaker mode. Uh, I don't live beside high voltage power lines. I don't live near cell towers. I don't use electric blankets. Uh, um, I don't have electrical devices by my bedside at night. 
I, I, I just do, I mean, I'm a product of this century. I love this century. I love the stuff that's available. And I just use it as prudently as I can uh, uh, to have a good, a good life. But I don't wig out. Um, uh, and, and, and people who, who um, experience uh, hypersensitivity have a tendency to do that. And it's self-destructive. They, they get laughed at by the industry because they know that they're, they're, going, to, they're going to self-destruct. How foolish is it to have somebody who's grossly obese, smoking cigarettes, have uh, no exercise, and they're complaining about Wi-Fi? It's, it's ridiculous. All of them are stressors, and they are now focused on a stressor that's a small stressor compared to the larger one in their life, and they're blaming their problems on Wi-Fi. It makes no sense. It makes no sense. Uh, uh, I do not put myself uh, into that. Uh, uh, I, I do not. I avoid that. I avoid all stressors. I certainly avoid EMF stressors to the extent that I can. Mm-hmm. And when I go into the city, I was <laughs> I was making measurements of the environment as I drove from the country where I live into the city, and I could see the ambient levels go up. I could see it spike as I drive past the tower. Mm-hmm. But I don't live there. But I don't avoid going there because. I'm here, I want to go there, and the tower's in between, and I'll be dead if I'm going to let me, it stop me from going there. Yeah. Common sense. Okay. So, yeah, just on a side note with that, you know, a lot of us are a little bit anxious about what's coming in the future, like really for, like, my, my child, and, you know, I'm sure if you have grandchildren, like, thinking about this issue 20 years down the road where uh, we have small cells, all through the neighborhoods. Um, if we have just like the interactions at our offices and workspaces, I'm sure this soup of EMF is just going to be growing and growing and growing where it's going to be harder and harder to escape the reality of, of the ex- just the exposure times to, the, to this issue. So um, it's, it's a known problem and like we need to organize, I think politically or we have to like get this movement off the ground in some way where it's just known out there. People are more aware of it and it puts a little more pressure on industry and others to, you know, try to make safer tech or tech that will minimize exposures to people. Yes. So I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm wondering like, like, is that the right answer to like, is it going to have to be the average person is going to have to be the majority to come down back on this issue in the future? Well, there's going to have to be a political movement with clout. Uh, and political movements with clout don't have to be a majority. They, they, they don't even have to be white. They can be absolutely crazy. Look, look at the movement that says that there's no such thing as global warming. Mm-hmm. I mean, how nuts is that? Uh, but look, look at the traction it's gained. Uh, uh, look at the traction that's been gained by the principle that the uh, universe is 6,000 years old. That's wacko. Uh, uh, but it's gaining traction, not because it's right, not because it's the majority, but because polit- people have organized politically and brought that view forward in, in the dialogue of a society. Uh, but this is a free society, and people can speak whatever and say whatever they want. Uh, 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 and this is a government that is still responsive to the people. That's the reason why global warming is, uh, is making the headway it's making now, because people have organized, they've taken over the government, and they, they are now ensconced into government this crazy view. But, but, but the people who know better can emulate that process and take back the government. What's great about this country is that it's responsive to people who care. There's no other place in the world that's ever existed that's like that. That's why this, that's why this country is great. It's going to make horrendous mistakes, uh, uh, but it's the, still the greatest place on earth because it's responsive to people who care. And until people care, organize, and press back, it's gonna be more of the same. Common sense tells you that. That's the way, you can see that's the way our world's working here in this country. So let's say a movement did take place, even within, let's say the next two years, what kind of like timeline, because you're a lawyer, what kind of timeline do you think it would take legislation to actually get through on the issue where it could start forcing the hands of people to make more safe tech or at least it's starting to address the EMF issue just around public spaces? Even. Well, 
that that's not the way it would come about in a common law jurisdiction like the United States. It wouldn't work that way. Mm. What would happen would be a regulation equivalent to the idea, well, there, there are a bunch of ways it could go, but one likely way is that there would be, there would be uh, someone would come along with an idea. Uh, I, I want to build an electric car. Uh, and I'm going to have uh, uh, this car go by virtue of electricity. Now, this electricity is going to make god-awful strong fields. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 and now, before I can sell it to people, I've got to demonstrate that I'm not going to hurt people who live in those fields. Before you get a license to sell. So there's going to be barriers that go up to the entry of new products into the marketplace. Okay. Uh, you're Apple and you want to have wireless charging. So that means huge amounts of energy going back and forth because you're too lazy to put your <laughs> cell phone into the charger. Right. You want to sit back here and you want the energy to come to you. It'll come to the rest of your body as well as Apple is going to have to show that they can irradiate people with their charging energy and it'll charge the phone, but it won't harm, harm people. There's going to have to be pre-market approvals mm -hmm. right. now the ones that have already slipped through the gate it's going to be much tougher to wheel them in because of the pervasive nature of the grandfathering nature of our society our legal our legal system mm -hmm. they're there and, and they, they in good faith they follow the rules they made their product and they're out there it's going to be tougher uh, to get it's possible but the, the, the effort is probably going to come about by virtue of a decision that we're not going to go any further until we show that this is safe. Right. When they try to do those studies to show it's safe, they're going to fail because they're not safe. Mm -hmm. And then it begins to unravel, but it's going to take time. Yeah, it's never made any sense to me, even a person working in industry, that if they have any offspring, they're going to want their children, their grandchildren, future generations to be protected. And if they're contributing to the EMF storm and they're aware of it, it, it just becomes a moral dilemma in, in, those, in those minds if they you know, have a good moral conscience. Uh, uh, yeah, go it's, ahead. It's not like that. It's not like I, I, get, a, uh, it's, it's, I get a kick at how you, 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 uh, you nail it and then you move off to the left. Yeah. I don't have to say, listen, you got to come back. In, uh, in 1977, mm -hmm. I went to Pittsfield, Massachusetts, where the uh, uh, Electric Power Research Institute was funding research for what they hoped would be the next level of high voltage power lines, one million volts. One million volts. They had a test facility there. The power line is operating at one million volts. Mm -hmm. And guys are up there doing what's called live line working. They're actually working on the power line, standing on it, Energize the one million volts. Wow. And I was with Dr. Becker. Uh, and uh, uh, um, actually, excuse me, I was with a lawyer uh, from, the, uh, from the regulatory authority who brought me there and I, I saw what happened. And uh, uh, workmen came to us and said, listen, w w we have these pains in our joints when we work on there. W do you think it has anything to do with the fields that we're exposed to when we were working? So I told Dr. Becker, Dr. Becker said, I think it probably does, but tell them I'd be glad to talk to them and examine them and give them an opinion. So I went back to the engineers and told them, and to a man, they said, forget it. Mm. Forget. Why? It's their livelihood. That's how they make a living. Mm -hmm. They're worried about putting food on the table. That's their concern. People do that all the time. They, they, they risk their health for their job. Right, right. They, they have no, they feel trapped. They have no alternative. So uh, th that's a much greater driving consideration than is something that's going to happen to me in the future. Uh, yeah, I, I, I get your point now. Like, like we have risks all day. Like even when I drive to work, like there's a risk I'm going to get hit on the freeway. So there's risks all around us. And yeah, p getting the perspective on the vast number of risks. I, that's why I really see the EMF issue as a more of a long-term cumulative issue um, or just a, a longer stretched issue compared to something that's like a, you know, mechanical force violence that can disrupt you immediately. <laughs> but it can, of course. I mean, that's what the electric chair was. All, you know, all, all, human, all chronic human diseases like that. Mm -hmm. What causes cancer? 
oxidative what, what, stress. Huh? Right. Some oxidative uh, well, stress. Well, no, 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 that's a mechanism now. You want to <laughs> yeah. stay away from that. I'm talking about the factors in the environment that brought about cancer in this individual. Oxidative stress is a mechanism that what Dr. Becker would call stamp collecting. And if something causes cancer, then obviously there's a mechanism in the body that mediates it. There's a biochemical and there's a gene. Yeah. Uh, and the salient question, what the thing people care about is not how it causes, it's what does it? Because if you give them that information, you know what they're going to do? They're going to stay away from the thing that causes it. That's what they care about. Uh, but no one studies that. It's absolutely forbidden in this country to study what causes cancer. No organization studies it. No in, in organization is interested in what causes cancer. Uh, it, it's, a, uh, it's, it's not an acute phenomenon. It's a chronic phenomenon. It comes on uh, 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 in a sinister way. Uh, and if you, want to, if you want to establish a cause and effect relationship, mm. you've got to work really hard because it's not like a gunshot. Uh, right. but no one's doing it. And the whole medical industry is aimed at curing it. You're going to have a run to cure cancer. They don't have any runs to avoid cancer. Mm. And that's what 99.99% .99 of the people really want. They want to know what causes it. Mm. Uh, they don't want the cures are fine for the poor individuals that have it. But what people really want, whether they think about it or not, is doing what causes it. That's what they want to avoid. Nobody is studying it. Yeah, I mean. Nobody is studying it. So every chronic disease is like that, including the chronic diseases associated with EMF. Yeah, yeah, the, your, your insights are absolutely fabulous. <laughs> um, I, like, I, I view the same, similar kind of way like, um, like cigarette smoke. It's like anything that's, uh, just a poison, a toxin that's there around you all the time. It's just doing some work, doing some damage. And, you know, you might escape from the cancer. You might escape from uh, a disease, but the more exposure time, the more uh, you get of it, the, you're just increasing risk. And that's, that's, that's a great example. Uh, uh, cigarette smoke causes cancer. Well, cigarette smoke contains 1,500 to 2,000 chemicals. Mm -hmm. Which chemical causes cancer? <laughs> right. Nobody knows. All they know is that there's an empirical relationship between people who smoke and people who get cancer. And you know what? That's good enough for me to stop smoking. Right. I don't care which of those 1,500 causes it. Now, a, a, a basic scientist, somebody seeking knowledge for knowledge's sake, wants to know which one. And then he wants to know how it does it. Mm -hmm. He wants to know which gene it affects. Wonderful, great, that's cool. If you've got money for that, go do it. But that's not what people care about. They want to know the cause and effect relationship. And that's one of the very, 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 very few factors in the world that we have an accepted cause and effect relationship. We do between cigarette smoking and that. We do between asbestos and mesothelioma. Uh, 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 but beyond that, essentially nothing. Mm. So you are probably one of the most rarest people on the planet with your kind of insights, your background, your, your research studies. Uh, we all look forward to your works. Um, you know, I've got going somewhere here, of course, Becker, the research of the latest book that came out uh, this summer, like end of the summer. And uh, I'm really curious if you have any other projects uh, coming down the line. Yes. I do. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to work on, I am working on two books. Uh, one is, um, is going to be, um, in, in 1986, uh, um, I uh, wrote a book called Modern Bioelectricity. I brought together the top 25 people in the world working in the area, which was just beginning now. Dr. Becker had just retired, and, and, and we could see bioelectricity as a, as a bona fide a uh, subdivision of biology uh, that had great potential. And, and it's hard to know which direction it was going to go, which, which insight was going to mature. I brought together all 25, uh, and we wrote a book, and uh, I wrote two chapters, 25 other groups wrote 25 chapters, and we published it. Now, 30 years later, we can see what happened. <laughs> And the news is not good. I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to republish that book. You're going to see the original chapters, 
and I'm going to conduct a chapter by chapter analysis of what happened. Wow. You can understand that the field was killed. It died. Then uh, when that uh, uh, comes out, which won't be long now because it's going to come out as a Kindle book, so I won't have to go through all the trouble uh-huh. of, uh, of uh, uh, publishing uh, 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 the details that, uh, that are involved. It's very expensive. And that book's not going to make a lot of money, so I can't spend what limited money I have to, uh, to make it a print book. Uh-huh. There's going to be another book that's going to – it's going to <laughs> – it's going to go, it's, and it's going to pick up some of the themes you've raised today and to try to uh, 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 make it clear to people where we are now in 2017 and how we got there. And as I tell you, the story begins with Descartes in the 15th century and it ends now with a sad state of affairs, what you are trying to address. But um, <laughs> I, I, I can tell the story. I, I, I know. I know everybody who's ever worked in this field personally, certainly by the work. I've read it all. Uh, it's been, it's been, I can't believe it. Uh, more than 40 years. Um, I've worked every day full time on this subject and I've had never less than an average of about a hundred thousand dollars a year to spend on this research. There's never, go- and I had complete freedom to design my own experiments. There's never going to be another person who was uh, as fortunate as I was. So I'm going to try to I'm going to try to draw the conclusions that only somebody who's paid those dues and been that lucky can do. That's the second book. I see. Then I go into another direction. <laughs> <laughs> wow, this is this is just so amazing to have you on uh, this podcast. I can't thank you enough. And if there's any time in the future you want to um, you know, have a talk, uh, get an update. Um, we're going to be doing a lot of changes. You've given us a lot of insights, even on our website, how we can change that for the better. Uh, just anything, <coughs> anything insightful that you have, pass our way and we're open to it. Okay. All Good right. Talk.